athletes and fans around the world, welcome to another episode of Primetime Muscle. I'm Tim Wilkins, as always, joined by these two great guys right here, Chris Cormier. Real deal. How you doing, my man? I'm doing very well, my friend. I like and that shake. Just, just trying to, trying to be a little cooler. <laughs> you're, a little, you're helping me a lot. You're welcome. Tarek El Gindi, uh, all over the world judging uh, this season. How you doing, bud? Great. Um, a lot of great competitors. I'm telling you, the NPC Worldwide is becoming very international. And like I said on Olympia News, watch out for the Asian continent, especially on the men's Z category. I'm seeing some guys in Taiwan, some guys in Japan with a tiny little waist. Once they hit their stride, we could have Olympia champions in those categories. Wow. I, I'm going to wow. grab this right here because this is my category, but this is not anywhere near my size and conditioning. There are some guys this season, Ali Balal and uh, v Vitor Chavez, that are not from the Asian continent. These guys are bringing a new look and a new conditioning that is insane. Well, I'm going to have to geographically correct you. Oh. Is, is, is Brazil. Brazil. Uh, is Brazil, uh, Brazil, Brazil, Brazil is in South America. Ali Bilal is from Afghanistan. Is he? Yes. He lives, he lives there. He's Brazil. from there. Does he live in? Oh, when you see him at the New York Pro competitor list, it says Ali Bilal, Afghanistan. Really? Hence, he is from Asia. Hence, here I am correcting you. I know where Afghanistan is. You know, let me, let me tell you. In they school, thought. I was like an average student in all disciplines, but I was excellent in geography. I was never a great student, especially in high school, but in geography, I was pretty good. Okay, talking about yourself again. I just want to give a shout out to the fans that say they love the show, they do their cardio, and they even like Tarek sometimes. What? They even, you know, they talk about Tim, but when I'm on the road and, and all these different places I go, they always bring up the show and that they love it and keep up the great work. You know, Guys! You know, you know who loves the show? Who's that? Nick Walker's dad came up to me at the New York Pro. He goes, man, I love primetime muscle. You guys have great energy. You know, the mayor of bodybuilding, the mayor of bodybuilding. Yeah, yeah. Instagram. Dylan, yeah, he was, yeah, he said he met you. He Dylan, told me, he told Dylan, me the you. mayor of bodybuilding. Mayor of bodybuilding. He, he's from New York. This guy was the yeah. man in the forums um, in the early All the in the 2000s. We, we always hang out the And he Arnold. goes, Tarek, I love primetime muscle. Thank you so much for the support. We do it for you guys. Yes, for sure. 100%. We do it for the frequent flyer miles. So thank 100%. you, uh, guys. Uh, so we're talking when you know I, we you grabbed uh, men's physique and the aesthetics of that class and where it went. But over time, throughout the throughout the uh, evolution of bodybuilding, there are some physiques that have been more aesthetically pleasing and more perfect than others in their respective time. Chris. Fire this up. Go back to the 70s. Frank Zane. Woo! Zane Haven. I used to go by this guy's residence just to see if I can get a glimpse at this champion. Never did at his residence, but I would look into his yard all the time to see if I'd see him. But I'd see him at the, at the, uh, mail, at the mailbox place. He was standing in line, and sometimes I would strike, strike up a conversation with him. But uh, him and... Uh, you know, just to be growing up in Palm Springs and to see him on a, you know, sometimes I, I would go to the mailbox place and just hopefully I'd see him because he's just right next to Zane in Haven. And I, but I'd always cruise by his place and see if I could see him. First time I ever saw him was at a, a, a seminar at a smoothie shop in town where they sold supplements. Of course, back then there were only four. Right. Uh, a bucket of protein, multivitamins, aminos, and something else. But he was there. Mega pack. Mega pack. He was there doing a supplement <laughs> thing. Uh, who, who's on your next list in that era? All right, I'm going to go a little bit earlier. 1967, 1968, 1969, Sergio Leva. For that matter, I believe Sergio Leva is the greatest genetic a uh, gift we've ever seen and I know Phil Heath is right there with him but I'm gonna put Sergio Leva as one of the most beautiful aesthetic physiques tiny tiny little waist large clavicle bones with those massive arms massive. and then the legs imagine if this guy was right now competing with all the equipment with all the technology 
he would have won 15 Olympias. So, Chris, but I, go I, ahead. I, but I do uh, like my guy Frank Zane a little better as far as the, the, the separation. The, I mean, it looks like an anatomy chart up there. That's what I loved about this guy's physique. And the posing, I thought, was off the charts when it comes to showing that, that, uh, that physique now, off. Now, posing, I'm going to give you a warning. If you're someone who's going into classic physique or you're just really saying, hey, I'm going to study the greats and bring a pose to stage, be careful with your individual physique trying to recreate Sergio Oliva's victory pose. If you don't have arms like tree trunks, we see it all the time. you look like the monkey from Every Which Way But Loose. We see it you all the time. You just look like some <laughs> wild orangutan <laughs> trying to put your arms up in a V. It's not, you got to have trunks like he had. Yeah, and I want to mention a name here. I know Sean Ray. It was Sean Ray's hero, Bob Paris. Beautiful, beautiful physique. Bob Paris made history. Man, when you saw that on the magazines, it just couldn't get better than that. You wanted to have that physique. And one time I asked Sean Ray on a live, I said, Sean, um, who, who inspired you? Because you're one of those guys that inspired so many people. He said, Tarek, there's only one name that I wanted to emulate, and it was Bob that. Paris. I don't know about that. Well, he was a Chris Dickerson uh, lover. Not lover. <laughs> <laughs> He didn't like, love her. He didn't Sean? love him, but yeah, Sean loved uh, Chris Dickens. He he was his mentor. He said. So jo no, uh, jo jo John Brown was his mentor. John Brown's a mentor. He got to know Chris uh, Chris uh, Dickerson also. I was there. You were. No, I you understand. Were only, you were, were only, there, but you, you were, were only high. in Brazil. You were high. You were only in Brazil. You didn't know what you were doing. So yeah, let me, let me, you didn't know what listen, you were doing. Listen, I talked to Sean Ray all the time. You're dumb, dumb and Sean cool. Ray's. Uh, uh, inspiration for bodybuilding was Bob Paris, and his mentor was John Brown. Okay, now I, I know he had a relationship with Chris Dickerson. Okay, so and say some that. Of the other people, but say that you, you said are mistaking when you say he's only his Bob mentor. Paris. I love what we're doing. He said it's only Bob Paris. Look, no, I look love at what, the, the I love screen. It's the not like that. Can I punch him too closer? Often, you're, you're kidding. Are you swinging at Tim? He's swinging at me. Tim, I'm in the middle. No. Get him, Tim. This is phenomenal. I'm sorry. So, sorry. guys, let's go back to Bob Paris because you know it's one thing to have what you would consider an aesthetically beautiful physique. You've got a good amount of mass, you've got a good amount of uh, symmetry and gifted uh, genetic uh, stuff, but you look back to that era and bringing those poses forward, Bob Paris knew how to present that physique and bring out the very best. I love Bob Paris. He was one of the first very prominent bodybuilders that I saw uh, face to face and he was, gave me the nod like, kid, you're going places, you're going to be good. He was telling that to Chris Aceto uh, back at Gold's Gym. Uh, w right when I was starting to work with Chris Cito, it was back in 1991. And I, that meant a lot to me and I appreciate it to this day because, you know, stuff like that gives you the little uh, motivation that you need to, to move forward a lot of times with, say, with some of these young bodybuilders. Well, time has passed. I, I love to see this too, by the way, speaking of the history of the sport. Uh, I just saw a bunch of old pictures of Aceto during the uh, competition years. Guys. Yeah, I posted something the other day on yeah, C C3 TV. Check it out. It's Follow insane us. Insane physique. On Instagram. Uh, anyone else in that era that you look back and go, uh, all right. I'm going to mention uh, Serge Nubre. Mm. Serge Nubre oh, had a beautiful Serge face. Nubre, Don't man. pretend you, th you thought about him, okay? So, yeah, the, the Serge, Black Panther from yeah, France. Yeah, yeah, you forgot Nubre. about it. And now you, you're, you're jumping on my uh, When we were in wagon. France, we used to so call him Nubre. So much for your Cormier. Nubre. Cormier. Oh, I like that. I and like that. And you forgot that. about like the that. Nubre. Look at that boy. Look at I that boy. I punch you. Punch Look at that boy. I oh. see you, baby. All right. This is not the way the Hollywood Squares used to work. <laughs> God. Serge ah. Nubre had tremendous genetics. Serge Nubre. You got Serge Oliva, Bob Paris. Um, who else from back that. in the time? Well, you but know what? But the thing is, Danny Padilla was, 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 had a beautiful physique, but, too. But now that you mentioned Serge Nubre, he moved to Orange County. He was in Fullerton area, and he trained at the famous Blocks Gym. And that's where I got a chance to, to get to know Serge Nubre. And just, I mean, he's in shape all the time, tank top and shorts year round. And this guy was, you know, still had the abs in, until his last days on his earth. And he, he meant a lot to me because, you know, seeing another a black competitor uh, from France, Cormier, Serge Nubre, you know, you were from Le Palm Springs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Monsieur de Le Palm Springs. Monsieur Cormier. 
<laughs> Monsieur oh. All right, guys, we're gonna we're gonna keep walking through uh, the eras, talking about the most aesthetic physiques, and we got more coming back on Primetime Muscle. Stepping up the most aesthetic physiques throughout the sport in, we're into the 90s. And this is this is particularly great because at this point, during this era, one of our co-hosts, one of our, our co-anchors here, was in that era and is highly considered one of the great physiques of its time. Oh, God! And you, and you have to say <laughs> We're nice going to spend the whole segment talking about this guy. Oh, my goodness. Put the camera on this person. Look at him. Oh my goodness. I can't believe it. Oh God. I finally made okay. it. Okay. I'm gonna, finally I'm, made it. I I'm see gonna, my name up there finally. I'm gonna I'm gonna say Finally! I'm gonna say one time. Credibility and one to the show. One time only. Credibility to the show. One the, time and the, only, okay. And the producers has made this all possible. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate I'm it. I'm going to say something nice. I finally won something. I I'm won the big one. I'm going to say nice about Broderick Christopher Cormier, Cormier. from Palm Springs, California. <laughs> In 1993, I was 14 years old. I joined a gym in Brazil. And uh, the owner of the gym had pictures of all these guys. And he told me, this guy is the Mr. Olympia. This guy is Sean Ray, this guy is Flex Wheeler, this guy is Nasser, this guy is Chris Cormier. And I remember some of the older guys that worked out there said, the strongest of all of them is Chris Cormier, the guy that lifts the heavier. And I'm looking at pictures of all these guys. And I saw a picture of Chris Cormier in yellow trunks. Mm. And I said to myself, man. I want to have a physique like oh, that. Get a banana so, hammock like that. What? <laughs> That's where I thought he was going with that. No. Actually. <laughs> I thought he with the yellow banana. Yeah, no, we, I was not looking at your <laughs> banana hammock, okay, Chris Cormier. Um, but anyways, Chris Cormier, Chris Cormier, and he's one of my best friends. He's our co-host here. But if you look at Chris Cormier's physique, it's one of the top 10 greatest physiques in the history of bodybuilding. I mean, there was no flaws. You had the big legs, you had the large clavicle bones, the small waist. He had a roundness to his physique. He posed well. You know, it's hard well. to look at Chris Cormier and to say that you could want to have a, a, a better body. If Chris Cormier lived in this era right here, it would be hard for me to look at guys like Derek and Hadi and all these guys and say you have a chance against Chris Cormier. He would have been dominating like Phil Heath dominated and like Ronnie Coleman dominated. He was just in an era where you had Coleman, Flex Wheeler and all those guys. Chris Cormier is one of the greatest physiques of all times. Damn. Now give me a I Xanax. I said it's better. <laughs> <laughs> but enough about us talking about you, Chris. You talk about you for a while. Well, so, so let's let's talk about though the guys. One of the reasons, like Tarek says, one of the reasons that it was not an easy dominance for you is you were in stack. You were in a stacked era. You had Sean. We'll talk about Sean for a minute because Sean, as well as have just pleasing top to bottom, the muscle bellies, the shape, the posing, everything really came together for Sean Ray. Sean Ray was the standard of bodybuilding for us uh, in. In the mid '80s, he was a young teenage phenom. So he was the, you know, went into teenage California at a very young age, on the cover of Flex magazine from time to time, as a teenager, which was unheard of. But it, to that, you know, that made me want to follow in his footsteps. As far as like, man, if I put my, if I, if I cut my hair into a flat top, and then I, and I. Uh, you know, I, I get me a red Corvette and a, and, a, and a bum bag with these little scrunchy socks and Reeboks <laughs> and match my clothes, 
I was like the Sean Ray starter kit. You get the flat top, get the red Corvette, you know, go to Venice Beach, be, be seen and be in the magazines. Uh, you know, I started to be in the magazines at 17 years old, you know, going from there to the Team National, Team California, done all these competitions. And I actually moved to Orange County just to be around people like Sean Ray. So I was in Fullerton, you know, in Block's gym, like I was saying about Surgeon Bray, but that's where I got a chance to get to know these guys. And that's when I got a chance to understand that Sean Ray is going to forget his wallet every time he goes to, to lunch with you. And you're going <laughs> to be paying for that lunch. He did that to me so many times. Like, oh, I forgot my wallet. Okay. I forgot my wallet. You said in a previous episode of Primetime Muscle about having a notebook with guys that you admired. Yeah. Uh, my training partner at the time, Ron Walker and I, huge Sean Ray fans. He was at the top of our list because we were teenagers at the time, too. We're all the same age. And we're looking at a young guy winning that much that looked that good and thinking, that's, that's what we want to be right there. That's the guy. There's a picture of him at Gold's in Venice. And um, I remember being there one time with um, other judges. There was bodybuilders after a show uh, in Culver City. And all of us just looked at that picture of Sean Ray and we were like, man, what a beautiful physique. And again, like Chris Cormier, he was an excellent poser. He displayed the beauty of his physique. 1994, Sean Ray, man, it's, it's like you show those, those pictures of 1994 Sean Ray, and it's hard for us to see any bodybuilder that has presented a more beautiful physique on a stage, he is one of the most aesthetically pleasing physiques of all times. But they also just routines, uh, Tarek. Uh, I can still see it now. You know, 1987, when in the Nationals, the, uh, I forgot the name of the lady, but, uh, and I am telling you. Mm. That whole thing. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, doing the spin, I had to emulate a lot of his poses because they were just so beautiful. It was like, you know, doing the spin. I, I see a lot of guys now today, like they got four feet and trying to do a spin and it just looks terrible. And they're doing it the backwards, the, actually the, the, the wrong way you're supposed to spin. You're supposed to spin into it and throw your whole body into spinning around. Could you These demonstrate guys, that for us? Oh, sure. Right here, right here. Oh, Where do go. we go, Nico? Here so he go. can demonstrate let's that go, right here. Let's go. I want to see go. that spin here. Let's go. Okay. All right. So when you come in, you're creeping around. You bring, twist your body, and you float down. These guys are going. Oh, that is just clumsy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know. That's how you do that it. Was, that was amazing. <laughs> that was amazing. With these shoes on, that's all, yeah. I, can do. That's all so, I got. Chris, you have talked about being in the grocery store and being in the gym and mean mugging guys and not acknowledging they even exist. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Over the years of hearing your stories, probably the one you mean mugged the most was Flex Wheeler. Yes, Flex, my nemesis, my friend, my buddy, my nemesis again. That's how we were, that's how Dude, we- Dude, there's still tension between them. To this day! To, to this day, there's to this still day. tension. One won the <laughs> Iron Man one week, the other one won the Arnold the next week. There's still tension between them Flex Wheeler, 1993. Well, from the cow. We started the cow. Yes. So, 89, he won the cow, and I went there just to watch it, and I saw him sitting there looking like a little, I thought he was like a little kid, but he was, because he had sit there, like, and he had the, his clavicle bones wasn't large, like you like to yeah. point out, so. <laughs> what about his sartorius yeah, muscles? <laughs> his sartorius muscles wasn't like mine, and his clavicle bones was short, so I was just looking at him like, hmm. He's going for the title. They said this guy is good. His name is Flex. He's got a fancy name. And he went up there and he looked spectacular. I mean, doing the splits, coming, you know, had those big biceps. Wasn't a big wide body, but super aesthetic. And at the time, those big round muscles and uh, super separated uh, guy, was, he was amazing. You know, and then we had a mutual friend named Rico. McClendon. And then that's, how, that's what made us glue like I was friends with him he was friends with him so that made us like that's my friend you're you're okay but you know it's because we were two alpha males wanting the same thing 
and it was not nothing more than that. But then we became training partners. We became co-workers at the Roxbury nightclub. We became, uh, you know, eating afterwards. You know, we was buying his meals, taking turns buying his meals. He didn't have a whole lot of money at the time, but he had a lot of promise. And he had this fancy name, and he had the aura about him that he's going to be a great champion, a great aesthetic champion at that. Winning um, the uh, USA in 1992, which we all trained together for that. And then I won in 1993, and then we won, he won Ironman, I won Ironman. He uh, won Arnold Classic. I did not win Arnold Classic. But the thing was, I always thought I could beat Flex. And he was always like, oh, you're, my, you're just my little brother. And so that right there irked me enough to where it's like, man. So when I did get to the, when the few times I beat him, 1995, uh, Olympia also uh, at the Arnold Classic when we went head to head. When we went head to head, half the gym was split on his side, half the gym was split on my side. And that's when we were coming together, coming, you know, facing off in the gym and catching eyes when we were doing cardio. Oh, Back um, in the 90s, that could usually <laughs> only be settled by a dance battle, some kind of a rap battle with a break dance. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no. yeah. That's how you say the were, community center. He was locking eyes with his banana hammock, <laughs> <laughs> asking on the, across, are you a Leo? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Thanks for being part of that amazing era and a guy yes. who's balanced and Thank big you. from top to Finally, bottom. Finally, my flowers. Thank you, Nico. <laughs> we my got flowers, baby. One more era to talk about with two guys that brought balance uh, and size to beautiful, uh, beautiful packages on stage when we come back on Primetime Muscle. People always ask how I got here. I was willing to work just a little harder than everyone else. Every damn day. If I can have hundreds of hours back, you know I'm gonna grab them. Spending hours prepping chicken, rice, and vegetables, F that. I rely on perfect nutrition. I rely on trifecta. And we are back, and the uh, guys of this era are two big ones, but two beautiful, beautiful, aesthetically pleasing physiques. Uh, you have to talk about seven-time Mr. Olympia, Phil Heath. Phil Heath, Phil Heath. I mean, I remember seeing him, and you know how we treated people coming in through Venice. It's not like, oh, just giving you your flowers. You have to prove yourself. So when he won his, his title and turned pro, I remember him walking in, you know, chest all high, coming in, nodding his head to me like, what's up? And I did, I did the whole uh, the old grocery store bit on him. I don't even see you yet. <laughs> but then he, st he started to do, do good, started to prove himself. So then we started to give him his, uh, give him his acknowledgement as a great champion, great aesthetic champion, great, very pleasing. Uh, the younger version of the field was just, oh, so man. You, you couldn't put a finger on the, the, the ceiling on which he can go. You know, so we, I think he started to get a little bit heavier toward the end. Uh, but, you know, all in all, he did put together a fantastic patch, package, a run of Olympia champions, uh, seven of them. And, uh, you know, I don't, he didn't, do, he didn't win the, the Arnold Classic, did he? He never won the Arnold Classic in Ohio, but he won the Arnold Classic that's where in we, Spain. That's where we're just saying. Now, one time he was at a, a <laughs> Cutler cast. Shout out to a Cutler cl uh, cast with Jay Cutler, obviously, and um, manager Matt. But one time he was there and he goes, well, I never won the Arnold. And then um, Jay said, well, you won in Spain. And, and Phil said, well, that doesn't count. It doesn't count. You know, so <clears throat> I don't know if it counts or not, but for him... It doesn't count. He doesn't feel like he won the, uh, the, the Arnold. Big, the but Phil, Phil Heath what, had a small waist, but his clavicle bones on top were not very large. And that was one of the things that a lot of people said, that he might be a little narrow on top, um, and the arms overpowered the physique. He worked very hard to get the shoulders out, to get the back out, to, to give that illusion, right? When it comes to three-dimensional look, nobody comes even close to him. And in my opinion, Sergio Oliva is the greatest genetics of all times. But 
three-dimensional look, Phil Heath is ahead of everybody. The only thing about Phil Heath was that you could have said he had, he was a bit narrow on top, but he fixed that in the end. And he was very aesthetic. One thing that people don't give credit to Phil Heath, he had monster legs, huge legs, huge legs from the side poses and big poses. And when people talk about uh, biggest legs, we talk about Tom Platts, we talk about so many guys, we don't mention Phil Heath, he had huge legs. It's just that everybody was looking at that back double biceps at those three dimensional arms. But that was Phil Heath in itself as one of the greatest masterpieces of bodybuilding. I wanna mention one name. He won the Mr. Olympia, rest in peace. He was a very close friend of mine. Man, I loved his front double biceps, Sean Roden. Sean Roden was, he was a, he was a great champ. I, I actually thought it was very close between uh, Sean and Phil, you know, leading up to him winning that show. I think it was like two years that I was like, oh, man, you're right there. You're right there to, to, to win it also. Which begs the question, Chris, and, and Tarek, I'll ask you as well. Had, had uh, Sean not had his issues uh, towards the end, uh, where was he in 2019 up against Brandon? Uh, if, he presented, if he presented the same physique that he presented in 2018, I think he, he could have beaten Brandon in 2019. I don't think so. You know, uh, now Brandon... Know. Brandon was another one with a very beautiful aesthetic physique. The question is, when Brandon won in 2019, it wasn't his best. We actually saw Brandon's best in 2020 and 2021. 2021, he beat Phil Heath, right? In 2020, he looked incredible. Big Rami just shocked the world. So Brandon could have had three Mr. Olympias if it wasn't for Big Rami. And we need to right. mention, along with Sean Roden, Brandon Curry. Do I think Sean Roden beats Brandon Curry in 2019? Possibly. But I don't think Sean would have beaten Brandon Curry's physique in 2020 and 2021, even though he didn't win the Olympia. I just thought Brandon had a, a master class type of look. You know, they had the aesthetics, but also a massive back. And uh, those arms was amazing also. Uh, but Sean Roden, man, you know, he uh, he that he peaked that that night. That was his night, and he peaked for it perfectly. Um, he wasn't a heavily muscled guy. He had a lot of real estate to try to cover, so I don't think his pecs and everything was like as huge as a lot of people would have liked out of the Mr. Olympia. But all in all, that night he peaked and he did his thing. I, I'm going to ask you both from your different uh, areas of expertise. Uh, I think there's a big thing among competitors at every level, from the NPC all the way up to the top of the pros, that mass is the answer to getting the title and keeping the title. And I think at some point, you start to widen the waist, you start to deteriorate a little, you get injuries. I, I yes. think there's that constant push for size. Chris, talk, talk to love, that. I love that because here's the thing, uh, Tim. When, as you get older, your waist starts to widen each year. I'm, I can attest to that. <clears throat> and uh, so you start to get to a point to where you got to look at your physique and judge it as such. If you have a short waist or if you have a long waist, that can dictate a lot of things. How much food you can consume and keep in that same shape. And there's a weight that you cannot go to that's going to take your aesthetics away. And that's what you don't want to do. And I think that's uh, a, lot of, a lot of the times as bodybuilders age, that's one thing that you can see is prevalent is, you know, how much food they're, in, they're consuming. And as you get older, all that st stuff changes. So year after year, your diet changes. You can't think that you're gonna use the same formula every single time you go to compete year after year after year. One of the reasons I like having guys have test shows so they can see what their prep does to their metabolism, their shape, their size, their digestion, the whole thing every year. And it's always changing, always. Tarek, what do you think of these guys? Uh, you know, they say, all right, I got to be bigger next year to keep the title, bigger next year to get the title. What do you think that's... And then you, then you got too big. Too big. Too big is too big. Well, I think it's cyclical. I think you started with aesthetically pleasing physiques, right? Um, you know, you, you, you look at Sergio Oliva, even Arnold for his height, he was a bigger than guys, but he wasn't like 300 pounds. 
Then you had Frank Zane. Then you had Samir Banu. You had Chris Dickerson. You know, Lee Haney was taller, but he wasn't 300 pounds. And then, like we covered a few weeks back, the Mass Monsters. Dorian Yates won, and he was bigger than everybody. What does that do to the competitors? Make them want to get bigger. They want to get bigger, yeah. you know. And what happened next after Dorian Yates? Now you're too big. We saw Ronnie Coleman. <laughs> yeah. He was big. Jay Cutler was big. Okay, but then, then you the people, saw, then then you the saw people that's trying to emulate those people, where do they go? Do they go try to get bigger? Well, it did happen with a lot of bodybuilders. Dennis James was one of the prettiest physiques at winning the USA. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, he won in 1999 the USA. It's almost like a clone of Kevin LeBron. He was beautiful. He had beautiful physique, beautiful lines. When he turned pro, he needed to chase Ronnie Coleman and Jay Cutler. So he just pounded the weights and became bigger and bigger. And then the weights started expanding. But do I blame Dennis James? What was winning shows was bigger guys. He could have stayed like Richard Jones, competed at the Olympia one time, placed 14th, and never I, be heard again. I beg to differ. He became relevant because he came close to those guys. Well, he beat me one, I think he beat me twice. We're not talking about you, jackass. But he beat me, listen, he beat me twice. I wasn't that much bigger than him, or, or when I had a taller, bigger, wider frame, maybe a little bit, but he didn't have to do it like that. He, all, all he had to do was slowly, gradually grow with that physique, and I think he would have had a way more successful career. And I was, I tell you, when he first turned pro, I was like, who the hell is that guy, you know? He's walking in goals, he's looking like, I didn't say anything to him, actually. For a couple well, weeks. Well, you gave him an attitude. I yeah. gave him an attitude. Oh, but my God. What is that? I mean, like, he was ridiculous. coming for what I got. This is ridiculous. He you know? was coming like, for what I got. How insecure do you guys this have to be? This is mine. That you can't say hi to somebody Not that's saying coming it, to the I gym. I don't see him. I don't see him. You know, it's like, come on. I don't see him. Very, very, <laughs> very small thinking. <laughs> but anyway, but I thought, I thought a lot of, of his physique, even though I didn't say hello. I... I I'm glad you guys shared all that because I think it's an important thing for the competitors. <laughs> no one, when you're coming up, you know, there is times you go to the judges and feedback and they say, hey, bigger shoulders, build up the low back. It doesn't mean you need to do 6,000 Eat a bunch of food. Eat a bunch of food and do deadlifts and blow your stomach up and have a gut and widen yourself out. And Even if you have a bunch of food at the table, that's not going to put density on your body. It's going to come from training and focusing on the different muscle groups. It's not going to come from... I'm going to have 1,000 calories, I'm going to have 10,000 calories, I'm going to have 20,000 if I can fit it all in because it's not going to compute to a great physique. Nope. Well, guys, it flies by. It always does. Uh, like, subscribe, share with your friends so they know what to do when they're doing cardio. Subscribe, uh, guys. Subscribe so you don't miss the next one. And share with us who you think were your favorite most aesthetic bodybuilders throughout the years. Pick your era, pick your favorite era. Everybody's got their own golden era, but uh, let us know in the comment section. Chris? It's been uh, real, my brother. It's been real. Tarek? Like, subscribe, comment. Let us know right now who do you think is the most aesthetically pleasing physique. Is it Chris Cormier? Please say no. Don't say no. Don't say no. All right, we'll <laughs> see you next time on Primetime Muscle. Go.